know that priests are religious leaders and serve as our spiritual fathers here on earth, hence the reason we call them fathers. But how well do you know them do? What do you know about their personal lives and struggles? Welcome to Catholic Faith Forum. I'm May, and today we'll be talking to two priests about their lives as priests. When we come back from this break, we'll meet our first guest. Stay with us. Welcome back. This is Catholic Faith Forum and today we'll be discussing the other side of priesthood with two interesting guests, but we'll start with our first guest, Reverend Father Gilbert Thessing, OP, who has been a priest for over 45 years. Father, you're welcome. Thank you. Ah, what's happy to have you. How, 45 years, that's a really, really, really long time. And it's all here in Nigeria. I was ordained in Ibadan. Wow. So what brought you to Nigeria and how has the experience been so far? I came to Nigeria in 1968 during the Civil War. I had joined the Dominicans right after high school and uh, well I had two years of university before going to the novitiate. I really got to know the Dominicans because they built a novitiate just 10 miles from my home in southern Minnesota in the USA. And so the Dominicans started coming to help in our parish at the time of 40-hour devotions or things like that. Okay. When the pastor went on holiday, we'd have a Dominican come and help us. And we enjoyed serving at the Dominican Mass because the Dominican Rite didn't have the prayers at the foot of the altar to begin. They started by preparing the wine and water in the chalice and other things in the old Mass. This was before the Second Vatican Council. Okay. So that's how I got to know the Dominicans and I learned of their mission in Nigeria. And they had a small newspaper called The Young Dominican. And I was reading that and seeing pictures of the work being done here in Northern Nigeria and here in Yaba. And so I got an interest in becoming a missionary in Nigeria with the Dominicans. Okay, so you requested to come to Nigeria? Yes. Okay, so how was it like growing up in Minnesota? Growing up, I grew up in a rural parry, or in a farm with my mother and father. I'm the third in a family of 10 boys. Wow. And my youngest brother was born the year I entered the novitiate. He was born in May and I went into the novitiate in August. And so I never lived at home with him uh, growing up only met him at the time when I was on leave from the Dominicans. And uh, to the, but all of us lived together. And I guess that's where I decided I wanted to be in a community of brothers. And okay. so the Dominicans had community life. My parish priest wanted me to be a diocesan priest. He took me to the seminary and showed me how the seminarians begin. And I said, I would rather be a Dominican, so we went to the novitiate and visited them as well. Okay, Father, so you've been in Nigeria for so long. What are some of the places you've worked? Well, like I said, I first came to the Diocese of Sokoto. I was up in uh, Yelwa, that's on the Niger River, just built, uh, by the north of the Kayenji Dam. The Kayenji Dam had been completed in 1968, and they flooded uh, half of the town of Yelwa, and it was new buildings built up. But the mission was not affected, but it was closer to the river. And uh, I was a mechanic. I worked with the uh, maintaining the mission. Do you still do that? I was there only six months because I was there to take the place of uh, Brother Lawrence, who had gone home on leave. Okay. And when he came back, uh, but in fact, in the meantime, I had gotten permission to return to the United States in 1969 to attend my brother's ordination. He was a priest with the Foreign Mission Society of Nigeria, the Marinos. So you have a brother who is also a priest? Yes, a younger brother. He's six years younger, but he's six years ordained before me. Anyway, uh, so when I came back from America in September or August of 
1969, uh, I went to Malamfashi in uh, Katsina State, and that's where we had established a catechetical center. And Father B. Jago was the director, and there were four other priests there uh, working in the bush, going out and visiting the uh, peoples, establishing the church. And uh, I had studied Hausa before I came to Nigeria in 1968. And so you I, speak Hausa? I had uh, at that time. I've forgotten most of it now. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, we worked together. Uh, but uh, then in 1971, in January, uh, well, in 1970, I worked in Sokoto with Bishop Dempsey, and we were talking about priesthood again, and uh, he encouraged me to resume my studies for priesthood. And so I got permission to go to Ibadan in 1971, in January, and I picked up my studies in philosophy and uh, joined the two Nigerian Dominicans, Callisto Seheme and John Nwanze, Okay, Father. So you've done a lot of work in the north, in northern part of Nigeria. What do you have to say about the current insurgence and um, persecution of Christians going on there? Well, in fact, my work in the north wasn't as much as I wanted, because when I was ordained, I expected to go back to the north, and I was told to be student master in Ibadan. And then after being student master for two years, I was elected to be the prior of the community. And then... Uh, in 1980, I was sent to uh, Ife to be chaplain at the University of Ife, and I was there for nine years before I was elected vice provincial. And so only in 1998, after completing my term as provincial and other priorship in Ibadan, I went to the north and I was pastor in Gusau in uh, 1998 until 2001. That was the time that uh, Governor Urima started the Sharia law, yeah. and uh, he took over one of our outstations. I applied uh, for help from uh, different uh, places. I wrote to the governors in the southeast. The governor of uh, Imo State in Oweri said, come and collect the check for 50,000 naira. So I drove down to uh, Oweri and went to the government house and I was able to collect money to help us to uh, restore the missions in the Sokoto Diocese and to continue our apostolic work. Where would you say is the most memorable place you've worked so far and why? Well, the first years in the uh, Sokoto Diocese were exciting, it was new, but then when I became a priest and uh, didn't get back to the north when I was named chaplain at the University of Ife. I w enjoyed working with the youth there. And uh, 1980 uh, was a time of prosperity for Nigeria, yet we still suffered the same there as we do now, lack of electricity. I remember students studying with candlelight and uh, we used generator many times. The charismatic renewal was active there. I was working with the youth in that program. And we got permission to start building our chapel there. The university allowed three plots of land for the Christians and the Muslims. And, uh, but then in 89, I was named to be the uh, provincial of our vice province. And that was also a uh, exciting time. I never expected it. I didn't deserve it. And yet that's what the Lord wanted me to do. So you've really done a lot of work in Nigeria since you've been here? Yes, all oh. of us have been able to do something. Okay. A though. little bird told me that you were kind of nicknamed Father Sharp Sharp. Here in Yaba at St. Dominic's, I was given that name. Okay, why was that? Well, I guess because I like to keep to time and I like to live, celebrate the liturgy according to the rubrics that were given. Uh, not to waste time. Uh, sometimes I think the choir do overdoes it. And <laughs> a few times I even made corrections at the altar, which was wrong, and I apologize for that. But uh, we learn our lessons, and uh, but the name has stuck. 
uh, <laughs> they keep uh, still calling me sharp sharp. <laughs> okay, Father, what's your favorite Nigerian food? I would say probably pounded yam and agusi soup. Father, you eat pounded yam and agusi? Oh yes, why not? <laughs> uh, all of you do, and I enjoy all of the foods in Nigeria. Uh, if you can all eat them, why can't I? <laughs> okay, so what advice do you have for young people who are struggling to decide if they want to go into the religious life or become priests? Well, I just read recently that Father Justice, so who left Nigeria three years ago, uh, told uh, one of the priests in the University of Indiana where he's working now, tell them to pray. If they want to discern their vocation, be a man of prayer or be a woman of prayer. And this is the same thing the, the saints keep telling us. Uh, Mother Angelica always said, live in the present moment. And listen to God speaking to you. And so that is the thing to do. Respond to what is happening at the present time, but look to the future, but do what is necessary here and now. Okay, Father, looking back at your years, many, many years in the religious life, do you have any regrets? Uh, probably that I didn't uh, do enough praying. Uh, sometimes you get involved in the practical work, and you, I never deliberately skipped prayer, but at the same time, sometimes you get caught up in doing things that uh, you say, well, this is more important than going to the chapel at this time. Uh, but uh, generally, I, I don't have any great regrets. Perhaps when I was provincial, I didn't listen to the consul uh, sometimes as I should have. And uh, if I would listen to them, we may have not uh, done this or done that. That didn't progress as we expected. But uh, at the same time, uh, it's important that we trust in the Lord and not be afraid to make decisions that move us forward. Father, if you weren't a priest, what would you be? I don't know. <laughs> I never uh, thought of getting married from the time I was in high school. Uh, when I finished my schooling, I thought of maybe joining the military like my two or three older brothers did. Uh, but after that, then you settle down. My two older brothers both married at the age of 30. So when I was 20 and went to the novitiate, I hadn't any thoughts of uh, getting married and I never had a uh, romantic relationship uh, with a girlfriend. So uh, the Lord called me to the religious life in the Dominicans and that's how I've responded. So I, I never had any thoughts of doing anything else. Okay, so how did you get the call? How were you so sure that God had called you at that point? Well, by visiting the Dominicans, by responding to my parish priest who said, uh, be a diocesan priest and knowing that diocesan priests uh, generally lived alone in a rural parish, and I didn't want that. I wanted to be in a community. I saw the Dominicans living community life. Thank you very much, Father. You're welcome. It's been a very, very interesting time with you, getting to know about your life. You've actually spent most of your years in Nigeria. I think you're more Nigerian than me, actually. Well, <laughs> I've been here longer than you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Father. You're welcome. Welcome back. We're still talking about the other side of priesthood. And our second guest on the show is Father Chukubikem Okpechi, who has been a priest for over 44 years. Father, that's an amazing accomplishment. Okay. Okay, Father, what made you join the religious life and the priesthood in the religious life? I think the first thing is I was at home preparing to work. I did typing and shorthand. <laughs> and then my uncle who was in Guzao invited me to come to Guzao 
I went there and I saw the priests, different from the other priests who were at home. And uh, they showed me that they loved me. They showed me that they want me to do what I want to do and to enjoy it. And then as we were talking, I saw a book by one of the fathers called St. Martin de Porres. St. Martin de Porres is a, a co preter brother of the Dominican order. Okay. And that's the first thing I, I took it and I wanted to read it. I read and I enjoyed reading it. And I said, I think I should be like him because I didn't have any uh, any other uh, course, only standard six and uh, the normal typing and shorthand. So I say, since I don't have any other thing to do, I can continue to be a, a Dominican um, brother. And uh, the, when I told the fathers that I want to be a Dominican brother, they were happy. But they, one of them decided to say, I think you can become a priest because there is, you are still young. I said, mm -hmm. okay, for that uh, invitation to be a priest, I accepted. How old were you at that time? I think, I, I think about, about 19 or so. Wow. 19 years. Ago. So before your trip to Gusau, you, you the thought never crossed your mind becoming a priest. No, I was th thinking of becoming a priest, but not just not to be a priest as every person was going to the seminary at home. Mm. But um, when I came to Gusau, I began to feel more inclined to become a priest in the way I saw it being lived. Okay, Father, in your Many, many years of priesthood. Where are some of the places you've worked? I have worked in so many places. First of all, I worked in Guzao, I worked in Katsina, I worked in Funtua. And then after that, I thought it was necessary if they wanted me to do more work in the order. They sent me to study for the pre, for the novitiate to do the novitiate work, and that is the time that I went out from Nigeria to some parts of the world just to um, so broaden your knowledge. Yeah, broaden my knowledge. And uh, after I studied about one and a half years, I came back to Nigeria and became a novice master. Yeah. Okay, so where is the most memorable place you've worked so far? Memorable place I've worked so far? Mm -hmm. um, I can say just talking about the novitiate, I enjoyed my work in um, Ibado because you are working among people that are about your age and also people that are coming from the same country. I enjoyed the, the, the life there. Okay, so what was growing up like for you? When growing up? Yes, okay. how was your home life? Um, okay. You had other priests around you? Yeah, in, at home there was uh, people who were ready to en enjoy life and uh, myself, I wanted to go out and study some other thing. And by that time, I felt that I should do typing and shorthand. And through learning to type and write shorthand, I felt I was able to work in the world. OK, so did, did marriage ever cross your mind at that point? No, I think I hadn't a mind to marry. Not that, you know, it, it's when you, you have grown old, and I mean, you have grown to the age mm -hmm. of marrying, and also you have money. <laughs> you, ha 
then they can begin to uh, pick up that uh, work of being a, mar a married man. And, and I wasn't in any way able to get money to do any, anything. So the major thing that I had in mind was to prepare myself to go and join the world in the working for myself. Okay, so what are some of the challenges you faced as a priest so far? Okay. As a priest, I think most of the challenges was just to be able to do what I was asked to do. Because sometimes I know that uh, when we were in the, student, in the studio, they ask you to do certain things. You feel that maybe you are not interested in doing that. But I think when I began to feel like after ordination, I say everything that I was asked to do is towards my good, being good. And so that is uh, the reason why I don't think that anything just made me feel unhappy. I've been happy in my life as a priest, that's a major thing. Okay, so do you have any regrets at all? Anything no. that you did that you wish you didn't do? Anything that no, no. you wish you had done? No, I don't, I didn't have any regrets. Hmm. Because one of the things about it is, as soon as I become a priest, when they begin to send you to do things outside and inside and you do it, and when you finish one, they ask you to do, to another, do another one. one. You, you don't begin to think of what to do. <laughs> and I think that is uh, what made me feel joy in my heart. Okay, so what advice do you have for other young people who are struggling to decide if they want to join the religious life or go to, into other parts of the world? Yeah, I think the first thing is, if they are, are you thinking of becoming a priest, if the person is thinking of becoming a priest, and then I will ask, what type of priesthood do you want to be? A religious or a diocesan or any other kind of religious life? So if the people tell me what they want to be, then I begin to advise them on that particular reason. Where? Okay. Um, if you weren't a priest, what would, what would you be doing right now? I haven't thought about what I'll be doing now because I'm, I've been a priest from my uh, <laughs> young, young age. Mm. So I've enjoyed being a priest and I love it. I think I will die a priest, so that's <laughs> <laughs> So that, can you mention one thing that you enjoy most about the religious life? Oh, religious life at least. One of the things is to be a member of a family. When I, when, I, when I think of uh, my being religious, I feel that I'm at my home. Back in my village, I was a member of a family in a particular family. We enjoyed our life, tried to work together and feel the joy of being uh, members of a family. And also, when you become a religious, you want to continue what you have been learning or been doing. Yes. Yeah, so I, I enjoyed being a member of a home. And through that, you make up other people feel joy. And uh, also, you are part of the whole world making people feel joy. Okay, thank you very much, Father, for being on the show. That's the end of our conversation for today. Okay, thank you so much. Every state of life is a choice. But in choosing, you must bear in mind your eternal happiness with God. If God is calling you into the priesthood or the religious life, rest assured that it can definitely bring you happiness. Thank you for being with us on the show today. We'll queue to Collins for today's episode of Know Your Faith. Stay with us. Hello and welcome to another awesome episode of Know Your Faith series. I am Collins. And today we'll be talking about the angels. On previous episodes on the KYF, we talked about heavenly bodies, angels, saints, and other spiritual beings. But today we'll be talking about angels. 
Now, the Catechism of the Catholic Church clearly affirms in paragraph 328, and it says, the, the existence of the spiritual non-corporeal beings that sacred scripture usually calls angels is a truth of faith. The witness of scripture is as clear as the unanimity of tradition. They are pure spiritual and personal beings with intelligence and free will, um, in, and f with intelligence and free will. Now they are immortal and they appear to us humans in the apparition uh, in operations as in human form. However, they do not have bodies, seen as they are purely spiritual beings. Um, according to the Catechism of Catholic Church, it teaches us that there are nine choirs of angels um, following the hierarchy, you know, from the lowest to the highest, or from the highest to the lowest. So, and these nine have um, different hierarchies. We have the first sphere, the first sphere, the second sphere, and the third sphere. So in the first sphere, these are angels that serve as the heavenly servants to uh, as the heavenly servant of God, the Son incarnated, and they include um, one seraphim, two cherubim, and three thrones. Um, the second is the second sphere, and they work as heavenly governors of the creation by subjecting matter and guiding and ruling the spirits. And they include dominions, virtues, and powers or authorities. And the final sphere is the third sphere, and these are angels who function as heavenly guides protectors and messengers to human beings. And they include principalities, archangels, and angels. So there you have it, these are the nine choirs. Um, seraphim, cherubim, thrones, dominions, virtues, uh, powers, principality, archangels, and angels. Now the word angel means messenger. So literally that's their existence. They, serve, they exist to serve and to, as, as a messenger of God. And we see in several verses in the Bible, uh, we see in, um, where God sent angels to deliver messages. We see in um, Genesis 22, 11 to 12, God sent an angel to Abraham to stop him from sacrificing his own son. We also see in Matthew 4, angels um, ministered to Christ in the desert. And it was angel Gabriel who brought the news to our mother Mary that she was going to bear Christ our Lord. And we know that um, angels also witnessed the resurrection of Christ, as we see in John 20, 12 to 13. Now, the church constantly benefits from the service of the angels, and um, Archangel Michael is known as the guardian of the church. He is the guardian of the entire universal church. The feast of the Archangel is celebrated on September 29th, while the memorial of the guardian angel is celebrated on October 2. So, that's it for today, guys. I hope you learned a lot of things, or new things about angels, their choirs, their states, and their the essence of their existence. So thank you for joining us today. Please feel free to like and share and subscribe to our channel. Until I come your way next time, be bold and be Catholic. Welcome back. That brings us to the end of our show for today. Hope you had a lovely time with us because we definitely enjoyed our time with you. For questions, suggestions, inquiries, anything you want to tell us, anything you want to share with us, feel free to talk to us and reach out to us on our social media platforms at CFF on TV. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel at Dominican Media Presents. Join us this Tuesday at 7 p.m. on Twitter for our CFF chat room. Is there any question you've ever wanted to ask a priest? Feel free to share it with us on Tuesday at 7 p.m. And we'll definitely reach out to you and respond to all your questions. Thank you for being with us. Till next time, keep being saints in jeans and shirts. For our Tuesday chat room this week, we're going to be... Hmm? What's our question? Okay, yes. From which point should I take it? Okay. Join us this week on Tuesday at 7 p.m. for our CFF chat room. And our conversation is going to be... Join us this Tuesday at 7